All right, uh, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you taking the time and the extra step for preparing for your hike on the AT. Real quick, um, I just want to um, take a second to introduce ourselves. I'm going to throw it over to the notorious KHP to introduce herself. Thanks, all right. Hey, y'all, I'm Captain Herndon Powell. Um, I'm the regional manager for ATC in our uh, central and southwest Virginia regional office in um, Roanoke, Virginia. So anyway, I get to work with seven different trail clubs in Virginia and uh, supervise bridge runners. And one of my favorite things to do is to teach Dig No Trace, where we always get to talk about digging cat holes and all the details of the decomposition of human waste. So I love talking about this stuff and can't wait to get into it. Oh, also, I guess I should mention I, I threw hiked the AT in 2006. I know that was a while ago, um, but I did, <laughs> did do it once. And also, uh, the Pacific Crest Trail in 2010. Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Always great to have a fellow master educator. And hey, how's it going? Um, nice to see some of y'all again and uh, some of y'all for the first time. My name is Stephen Aaron. I'm the trail facilities manager out of the Asheville office. So I spend the majority of my time setting up trail crews for success um, in our different maintaining clubs in Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, and also planning a good amount of trail crew operations in the Smokies, which I'll actually talk about later on in this presentation, foreshadowing. If you've been following the ATC's communications at all this year, you know that we've asked everyone to postpone their long distance hikes. The pandemic is still ongoing, so we haven't changed our, gu our guidance. Hiking is a form of interstate travel, which makes it a public health risk. The safest thing for hikers and for the communities they pass through will be for everyone to continue to put off their long distance hikes and stay local to the, for the remainder of the pandemic until we can get some kind of consensus herd immunity. We continue to monitor the situation in all 14 states and hope for the good news um, but until there's an effective, widely available vaccine or treatment for COVID-19, we won't be encouraging long distance hikes or recognizing them with 2000 mile certifications. So you might be wondering, why are we hosting these sessions with advice for long distance hikers? Well, it appears that people are still gonna go out on long distance hikes in 2021. Um, and we wanna continue to help up people to, for their long, set up people up for success with the long distance hikes after the pandemic is long over and it is a thing of the past. Um, ATC is in a unique position to reach a lot of people and consider um, considering a long distance hike uh, with information. And we always hope to minimize the risk of COVID-19 and all other different um, impacts uh, ecologically and on other people's adventures. ATC is hosting these sessions does not mean it's safe or advisable to hike in 2021. It means that we are determined to do what we can to minimize the risk and set you up for success. All right, so let's hop over these AT basics. If you've seen this presentation before, just pick a different stat that you did that didn't kind of blow your mind last time. But um, the Appalachian Trail, uh, tw over 21 and 90 miles. Uh, yes, that um, uh, distance fluctuates every year with different levels of re uh, reroutes um, and relocations that uh, might be in more protected or more scenic parts um, of the Appalachian Trail. Um, the management um, is, uh, really is absolutely fantastic. It's, a, it's, a, it's the comprehensive management structure that is the um, dependence of local volunteers that really help maintain and manage the Appalachian Trail. All logists and um, land managers, uh, federal land managers like the National Park Service, the United States Forest Service, um, or state um, and, and, or local parks managers to help um, kind of bring things together, as well as the Appalachian Trail Conservancy to help draw different lines, help bring in some cash where we can, um, and to help set up all folks for success to um, help maintain this amazing volunteer project. Uh, the trail goes over 14 states, six different national parks, um, eight national forests, um, as well as it's some absolutely amazing state parks and state forests. Um, there is uh, generally between three and four million people every year that enjoy the Appalachian Trail, though we spend a lot of time talking to through hikers and talking about through hiking in general. Um, that's a very small percentage of the people that are enjoying the Appalachian Trail, as you can see. It's only about um, three to 10,000 people that are attempting a through hike at any one particular year, as opposed to the three to four million of people that might just be out on a regular days, um, just trying to have an, a nice day hike, check out Maccabee's Knob, or just clear their head off after a long day in the Zoom box. Um, and always forever shout outs to the 6,000 plus volunteers that contribute to the 200,000 hours of service that help maintain the Appalachian Trail. That's um, helping to be ambassadors and provide education to different people in the field, doing the actual trail maintenance of clearing the corridor or um, putting in some longer term construction and rehabilitation to uh, um, strengthen the trail for uh, um, generations to come. 
It takes a lot of effort to protect and maintain the Appalachian Trail and its corridor. Um, your vacation and through hike were not made possible by accident. Uh, it was by decades and decades of, of work, dreams, and uh, um, passionate people making this amazing idea uh, come into fruition. All right, as I just mentioned, there are a lot of different ways to uh, uh, dig this cat hole. Um, so through hike specifically is uh, any um, complete hike of the Appalachian Trail under 12 months or less. A northbound through hike is still the um, most popular through hike hands down, and that's starting out in Georgia and going up towards Maine. Um, that is what I did actually in 2014. I don't know if I um, should have mentioned that I did end up through, I through hiked before I hopped on with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And I was in the middle of a, a, a huge bubble um, the middle with the th uh, through hiking uh, group myself. So it was a, quite the experience uh, of people rather than a wilderness experience of isolation. A Sobo or southbound um, through hike is uh, directionally opposite, starting up Maine at Katahdin and going southbound towards Springer. A lot of times those generally start out a little bit later in the year as Maine is still plenty frosty right now. Flip-flop through hikes, uh, a lot of the ideas have been started around starting in Harpers Ferry and going south or going north and then going back to Harpers Ferry and doing the opposite. But flip-flops can go from all over. Um, a good buddy of mine did it from his hometown in Franklin, North Carolina, where he basically just wanted to uh, flip-flop from Franklin so he could um, hike back home from both directions. So he caught um, rides out to Katahdin and hiked home and caught a ride to Springer and uh, rode home. Again, other than different kinds of section hikers, um, long ass section hikers, uh, pardon my French, but I'm going to inevitably end up using the S word when we talk about poop later. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, break the ice right there. Um, it's just people that take as long as they'd like. Um, maybe they're due, they just want to hike for one week every year for decades. That's what Dr. Jeff Marion, one of the greatest recreational ecologists to ever, that the game has ever seen did. Uh, he took 27 years um, to do his through hike and he watched the trail change as well as he watched his body change and his gear change and everything in between. So that was a, quite the different experience rather than um, you know one intensive summer that, that might be a blur 27 years later. So it is absolutely encouraged and plenty of people end up hopping on with dreams of a through hike and enjoy for a hundred miles and don't end up coming back for another section. Again, there are different ways to do this and you don't necessarily have to stay to the one idea that you kind of, kind of got stuck in your head the first time. And again, the majority of the people that are out on the Appalachian Trail out for a quick day hike, maybe a quick overnight, hammock nap, bird watch, pray, play, or stay all day. So a lot of ways to enjoy the Appalachian Trail other than just the through hike. So good thing to share and make sure that's not always uh, encompassed by us uh, Georgia and Maine folks. So everyone, I want you to take a second. I'll shut up for a second. I want to reflect on what kind of experience you were hoping to have um, between the blazes um, from Georgia to Maine. All right. I see Bruce is looking to connect with nature. Purely put, that's a, it's a good foundational um, sound. Always sounds intangible. It's always surprisingly easy to do. You know, uh, uh, Wi-Fi connections can sure be spotty, but the connection in nature is always so strong, I think is uh, the cliche of the day that I will be going with. So with that same reflection that you have in your head and your own experience, I want to look at some of the stats of what kind of through hikes can um, kind of look like. And you can see the spikes of different kinds of through hikers throughout the years, um, throughout what kinds of through hikes. So. Um, while you are continuing to share those reflections. Um, I want everyone to look on these stats. Can you see the big Bryson bump um, from what is caused from a walk in the woods? Um, yeah, I'm seeing some nodding heads. Good, good. Um, uh, yeah, you can really see the, um, the vast majority of people that really started to through hike after that um, 1999 to 2000 um, with that orange line showing those Georgia northbound through hikers. Uh, the blue, um, green, and yellow show the different kind of opportunities we have. Again, the um, vast majority of people um, generally below the classic northbound through hiker stuff. So if you're looking for a more wilderness experience where you're a bit more isolated, a northbound through hike starting March 16th or April 1st is probably not what you're looking for. Other considerations to generally make uh, during your through hike are, um, is terrain, of course. If you're gonna do a southbound through hike, you're starting off at Katahdin, um, which is the hands down the most difficult mountain to climb on your through hike. So if you don't know that ahead of time, it will probably break your spirit a little bit if you think that that's gonna, what it's gonna be like for 2,200 miles, because it just doesn't seem as feasible as maybe starting in some of the softer Appalachian hills down here in Georgia. 
Um, other things you got to pay attention to are definitely the crowds. Uh, um, everyone always pictures themselves by, by themselves in the woods, but the second it starts raining and it's cool, everyone will start um, collecting in shelters. Because of the coronavirus, this is a particularly bad idea this year. Um, we are definitely um, having everyone to consider, um, as shelters are still closed and are um, on the vast majority of the trail outside of the Smokies, um, we are um, still very much telling everyone to have their personal shelters to be able to stay uh, by themselves and not share airspace throughout the night. Um, that's going to be especially hard to do, even if you have your tent. Again, when it's cold, wet, and rainy, as it as it was on this night in the Tri Corner Knob in the Smokies. So, um, keep that in mind. Set yourself up for success and uh, make the hard decision if if you need to, especially during this pandemic. Um, I said it was a little softer down south, but also we can get you a little bit. Um, even this time of year, as it starts to get um, warmer, as you know, we always have Februarys or we have 70s, you know, five or six uh, days like that. And everyone just starts to assume that that's what the rest of the year um, is going to look like into the summertime. Definitely not the case in the mountains. Um, even on uh, days when I was out maintaining the Appalachian Trail last week, where it was 70 degrees, I was clearing a, bro a blowdown in particular that by the, down by the time I got to the trail, it was still ice and snow covered. Um, because uh, it was still well insulated and uh, still um, getting pretty good um, dumpings of snow regularly. So always pay attention to that. Um, also shout out to my friend, uh, Jeff Curtis, who got frostbite in the Smokies uh, during spring break. Generally speaking, on a northbound through hike, I would always keep your winter gear um, anywhere below Mountain Rogers because uh, winter seems to be available 12 months of the year um, in the Smokies, around Mount Rogers, around the Marone Highlands. So always be prepared for it. Leave no trace. Again, there's a lot to be said on this subject, and I certainly like to talk about it. But I'm just going to hit you with a couple quick things, very much through hiker specific. So one, plan ahead and prepare. I want you to come with the proper equipment and be able to handle extremes with the environment that you, that you enter. Um, bringing the lightest equipment in a lot of cases um, means that you aren't as prepared for extremes. What if the jet stream dips and all of a sudden it's 70 mile an hour winds? It doesn't matter exactly how warm it is. If it's slightly cold, you can get, again, frostburn and surprisingly warm temperatures when it's that windy. And that's something that happens on the Appalachian Trail regularly. Two, protect sensitive water ecology, um, travel and camp on durable surfaces. Uh, good campsites are found and not made. Uh, there is well over enough overnight campsites on the Appalachian Trail already. If you think about it in that um, graph that I showed you, this is a massive um, bubble of people that are going through at the particular weather window that is appropriate for the Appalachian Trail. 95% um, of the nights um, that those uh, campsites see have no capacity and are generally for a, a lower amount of hiking that is on the Appalachian Trail in Georgia outside of that through hiker bubble. So try to find a campsite that has already been made and don't try to continue to make a new one. Campsites that get made um, and are used after about three to five days can be, get on a permanent status where it's very difficult to renaturalize because they will continue to look impact and inviting for other people that are looking for a place to stay um, until it was roped off and people were really um, considered that roping off. Three, um, dispose of waste properly. You better believe we are going to be talking about this one later on today. Um, so uh, I'll skip the toilet paper and just really um, hit the point home about litter. Obviously, you're going to want to break down all your bulky packaging um, while you're in the grocery store, while you're in town, while you're at your house, because you don't need to bring all, all sorts of different extra litter to bring with it that you might accidentally drop. Um, individually packaged stuff um, might make sense for if there you want to have one snack a day, or it might end up with a lot more trash than you want. So it's just something to pay attention to throughout your system. Um, when you're um, removing the corner off of a wrapper or a bar, try not to pull that corner all the way off the wrapper as it will be a tiny piece of trash that will fall out of your pocket, AKA micro trash. Ridge runners, ambassadors, wilderness strangers are picking this stuff up all day. And it's not even your fault um, because you were probably trying to take it out. It just fell out of your pocket. Plan ahead and prepare, set yourself up for success. Number four, um, leave what you find. Just leave it, leave it. Any beautiful thing that you see that you wanna take home, put on your mantle, put in a box, shove it away um, for you to keep for another day. Um, takes away any opportunity for anyone else to enjoy that thing as soon as you take it away, as well as it has a chance of spreading different fungal pathogens. Some of the worst invasive species, including the hemlock woolly adelgia, are just from people kind of moving um, things outside of uh, the regular range. Um, someone moving, moving an ornamental hemlock over to Richmond, Virginia, so they could have an evergreen from each continent at, in their front yard. That's how we got hemlock woolly adelgia. It's the same general, general principle to leave what you find. Don't spread stuff all around because of different um, 
because of the ecological benefits, you don't want to take any nutrients, you don't want to spread any fungal pathogens or bacteria that I was just speaking of, and also for um, cultural reasons, you don't need to kind of be a, a grave robber pulling different artifacts, uh, pottery pieces, especially out west, arrowheads, things from the land where that might have been another one of the major reasons why that wilderness area or public lands was protected, was to protect those cultural um, artifacts. Minimize campfire impacts. Don't burn anything other than forest products. Burning trash leaves a residue that if it's a smellable like food, um, not unlike uh, burning burning um, food onto your pan, has a residue that smells that bears can smell from a long way away. They smell over 200 times better than we do. So that smell will remain even if um, long after any visual component is removed from you. Um, also, uh, in terms of um, just really try to be uh, mindful of this, uh, the size of a uh, campfire that you're having. If you were collecting every other piece of wood around you that you were kind of generally trying to burn, or if you notice that there is no dead and down wood anywhere near this giant campsite that you were camping in, it is because people have generally picked everything they can clean um, and have, have generally burned stuff. Don't ever um, cut, hack, or do um, or burn anything that isn't dead, down, dingy or small on the ground and even distant away from that popular campsite would be the most ideal, but not too distant. Um, really, we're talking walking distance, um, not leave what you find distance. Number six, uh, respect wildlife. Um, the greatest thing you can do is really keeping your food away from wildlife, um, really keeping uh, properly protecting your smellables with this bear hang. Oh, I'm sorry, I got a couple more images I've been holding out on you guys. Um, or uh, this yerk sack that you're seeing, this kind of black Kevlar is also a good option, um, but um, nothing is quite as good as that uh, old bear canister that you're seeing on there. Yes, there's some um, levels of failure, but uh, really they are seeming to be the most uh, and greatest way to protect your food against bear and mice consistently. Um, again, when we're talking about um, uh, respecting wildlife and keeping smells away, that's all, everything, including your toothpaste, deodorant, anything with a mild scent, making sure to get hand sanitizers without a scent so you never have to hang or isolate your hand sanitizer because you might need that in a moment's notice. And number seven, the way you um, be considerate of other visitors, uh, the way you act reflects on all through hikers from Georgia to Maine, past um, through hikers of decades and future ones. Uh, even before uh, you get to the trail sometimes, and especially for folks who end up getting off the trail early. So what I really mean by that is um, when you are outside, when you're taking your friends outside there, people are always paying attention to you, whether you know it or not, um, to see what kind of example that you are setting, um, especially if you know a bit more, even if you don't feel like you know more than your friend um, outside, chances are if you're the kind of person who's taking time out of your day to watch this kind of a thing, you might be the most outdoorsy person in your friend group. So uh, you're a lot more knowledgeable than you think you're um, setting an example, whether you know it or not. All right, atcamp.org. So um, those of you who've seen these presentations already know, but um, this is just a voluntary registration system that really helps to um, help show exactly the crowds that are um, looking to start your, start their through hike when and where. Um, as you can kind of see the differentiation between the different colors and lines, um, the light green is really showing the northbound through hikes again. Hands down, we can see again um, what we said previously is getting proved again in 2021 that northbound through hikes are hands down the most popular and is the largest bubble. Dispersing that bubble is generally how we can limit the greatest impact, which is um, another great reason for this uh, AT camp, as well as when a lot of y'all were reflecting on the um, experience that you guys wanted, it probably wasn't camping with a hundred other um, folks on the start of your through hike. So something to pay attention to. Um, so again, for um, pro tip, tips, if you're using AT camp, um, it's a lot easier to use on a computer. Um, it's doable from a phone um, for a simple uh, through hike itinerary. Uh, check the charts first before you register. This is checking the charts is kind of looking to see exactly um, where things are. You'd want to do that before you pick out, let's say March 1st. Again, always seems to be a ceremonial, very popular day. That is looking like it to be the most popular. Again, that red line right there is a the general capacity that we have for a sustainable overnight use. Talking about the amount of campsites that we have there. Um, we have a lot of sloppy campsites that are um, ecologically devastating or just generally not sustainable or not as good of other options that are, don't ha um, contribute to as much erosion in the different ri rivers around Chattahoochee National Forest. That's That line helps to keep steering people towards that general uh, carrying capacity. A registration is not a reservation. You will need to get permits through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, um, Shenandoah or Baxter when it comes down to that. Uh, through hikers do not need to select campsites. We'll um, look at exactly what that looks like, what AT Camp looks like if you are selecting campsites for just an overnight hike rather than a, um, a through hike or a long distance section hike. 
just so if you're through hiker you're just selecting the start point as i'm showing you the um, chart of just information from when people are starting so again if you need to change your registration just cancel it and do a new one it is um very difficult to do it you know you can't make any changes to your registration once it's already done um, after you've done this check your inbox in your junk mail folder as um, any response or ping back to kind of confirm anything might get caught there and as soon as you kind of confirm and pull that from your junk mail folder hopefully any other correspondence in the future will be safe so again um, if you're one of these at camp we um, definitely recommend it for let's say just an overnight hike you can um, very much plug in and your itinerary for a couple nights see how the crowds are looking on there for the other folks that have done that um, which will help plan for you again exactly what your desired um, adventure is going to be all right some more safety in general um, when it comes to situational awareness the first indicator that you should kind of go on is listening to your gut if something starts to feel sketchy if you start to feel weird you might have to do with just exactly what's going on with you internally um, if you're starting to stumble with the stumbles mumbles um, slips towards the end of the day a problem might be because your blood sugar or your hydration is particularly low so really paying attention to yourself and your friends around you is really what um, the best thing you can if there are sketchy people or sketchy situations in the Appalachian Trail please um, report those incidents to ATC um, to Appalachian Trail.org slash incidents those will get to trail facilities managers or regional managers like myself or Catherine um, who will be able to disperse them to other law enforcement officers other forest service personnel and to help um, kind of generally pay attention to those situations as they progress um, so again ATC is happy to help to send disseminate information um, that being said I um, appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to learn this other information how your adventure go has a lot to do with what knowledge you're bringing to the table and what kind of common sense you are using so please do not um, skip the bear selfies as we have in this picture right here um, consider carrying a satellite communication device on your through hike or just any extensive backcountry travel a spot or a garmin device is a good way for you to on a subscription basis press a button and you might have a pre-made text to kind of send directly to your mom's email that says stop worrying mom i'm doing fine look you can check out and see exactly where i'm camping on google maps I know the second my mom found out about this um, device, I basically it was basically required that I had to take it on my through hike, even though I was a grown ass adult by that time. Firearms, it is your um, responsibility to know the regulation for firearms whenever you um, do anything with it. That's not news to you if you're a firearm owner, but it's that much more difficult going through all the different land managers, through the 14 different states, as well as carrying um, a uh, metal device through the damp um, experience that is a through hike. Uh, uh, a lot of folks will let you know that you'll just be dingy from a long period of time, which is very bad for guns. Guns like to be dry or else they'll start to rust. So um, I'm speaking strictly from a buddy of mine who I threw hiked with who um, ended up sending his gun home. He had it for people protection rather than bear protection because it was just too difficult for him to uh, manage. Also, it weighed about eight or nine pounds with um, everything that he needed to kind of keep it as well as some different bullets so just again something you need to pay attention to in particular if that's what you're going on i don't think that um i mean personally if it's people are bringing a, uh, a gun for bear safety that's not something you necessarily need i recommend bear spray or clapping is generally something that's more successful um staying on top of the weather different forecasts is something that's always difficult to do in the mountains in general because it's everything's always changing so definitely try to um, look after your friends tell everyone what's going on but definitely um pay attention to yourself of the weather and forecast things can change you need to be prepared for those extreme temperatures atshelterweather.com or at i know um we always try to say it during each of these presentations and it has a delightfully generic enough name that it's something like that will give you forecasts for shelters in particular on the appalachian trail as well as key spots on the pacific crest trail great um website that's nice in nice and uh, personalized for uh, hikers so safety for COVID-19 uh, specific um, it's essential that you uh, um, your personal protective equipment to prevent against being an interstate transmission um, during this pandemic so your face coverings and having multiple ones so as with anything else all your clothes are going to get super gross you're going to want to have more face coverings than you would any other clothes i don't think this is a have a one set of clothing like a uh, um, character in a cartoon like most through hikers like to do um, your personal shelter is part of your personal protective, protective equipment as shelters um, generally on the at right now the wooden structures permanent ones are not something you should depend on in 2021 and are generally closed from georgia to maine your trowel and your hand washing kit and hand sanitizer are essential this year and yeah we'll talk about those a little bit more but really um actually no let's just hit this point home right now um privies are still closed um, between georgia and maine generally speaking with a couple exceptions being in the smokies 
Um, but the um, vast majority of crowds who might be spread out over six feet apart throughout the day um, are generally going to be hopping and going and trying to get to these privies, regardless if they're open or closed, because they're not closed, closed, let's say. There's not chained chained up or anything. So your um, personal poo kit and being prepared to poop outside away from the, these privies is the number one way that you can uh, prevent from going to these overly populated spaces or um, points of contact being the privies themselves in the backcountry. Other things to pay attention to, your resupply in town business to limit the amount of contacts that you can have and your maintain sh uh, shared standard of safety uh, and to maintain your shared sa standard of safety throughout what you do. Um, as you continue your plan, logistics will vary. Know that um, dogs are not allowed in certain parts of the trail and it's important to kind of plan for that. Um, your AT companions and different um, businesses in small towns are kind of prepared for this and there are uh, definitely kennels all around, let's say Gatlinburg. Um, to help protect uh, or help look after your dog as you're going through the Smokies. Over, um, very popular places that are prone to excessive impacts along the trail. So in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and in Baxter, um, they, they're very much required. So it's your responsibility to be able to, um, to get a proper reservation before getting into those areas. Again, transportation is very difficult to impossible to do safely during uh, a pandemic. So think about how you're going to do that travel in between uh, trails, I mean, in, in between trail and town. Um, and please register your hike on atcamp.org. It really helps to keep an eye on the, um, those numbers for fellow hikers as well as yourself. And again, with gear, again, really not spending all that much time on um, this themselves, really looking to hop into this poop because I spent too much time on the basics. But um, if you have any specific question, what kind of be um, gear and stuff you should uh, bring on uh, the trail, feel free to drop or shoot me an email after this in particular. Um, you will be constantly playing around with your sleep system throughout a long distance hike. Uh, try to try everything out um, you can ahead of time rather than, uh, you know, going and ending up on the trail thinking that you want a hammock hike from Georgia to Maine like I did, but realizing that you hate hammocks, which is totally a reasonable uh, opinion to have uh, because they're just not for some people. So just know what you like, know what works for you, um, and uh, you, you, will, you will set yourself up all that much better for success. All right, let's get to the fun stuff. Could some of y'all either unmute yourself or answer in the chat box, chat. what is brown blazing? All right, click over. Beats me, great answer. I appreciate um, some feedback either way. All right, brown blazing is one of the more common trail tactics that people don't even know what they're, that they're doing it. Um, and unfortunately, it's something that is a, a problem some years, but it's something that's just not an option this year. Brown blazing is when you end up planning your hike around where the privies are. So as you see, uh, with, with a lot of through hikers, they end up um, going, oh, are you stopping at that next shelter? Oh, is there a privy? Oh, is there a privy? Because a lot of people are really, they're scared um, to go cat holing. And that's for a number of reasons. The idea of pooping outside is just uncomfortable. Uh, talking about going to the bathroom is socially uncomfortable in general. Um, I'm not going to get into exactly why that is. I'm not a scat based sociologist, but what I am going to give you are some insights into a lot of the poo management in the backcountry and exactly some of the best ways for you to um, manage your own bowel movements and to be a cat hole champion. Um, so personally, it feels a little bit like a miracle that um, parting, part of pooping outside is that there are ecosystems up and down Appalachia that are ready to deal with your feces. It's, it's amazing that there are different uh, bacteria and fungus that are ready to break down your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and it's something that can actually useful and that doesn't turn this amazing wilderness wonderland into something absolutely disgusting. A lot of the information that I'm going to give you today is really around how we do stuff on the Appalachian Trail and in deciduous and temperate rainforests in general. Um, it's probably applicable if you, if there's a lot of green shrubbery around and you can get to soil, cat holing in general, but you'll see that there are other places that we will mention where it's not necessarily appropriate to cat hole. Shout out to my boy, Ryan Stolp on the, on the bottom of the corner here. He's holding up a bag. Yes, you know what's in that bag. We'll talk about that later. All right, real quick, let's start out with some science. Um, composting in your backyard or in a cat hole or in a privy is the same general function. All processes are balances of nitrogen, carbon, water, and air. The nitrogen, um, whether in your, um, in your backyard uh, food scrap is the food scraps or in a cat hole, it's poop in particular. The carbon level um, is a lot of what's already found in, in, in a cat hole is that uh, is already existing in the cat hole, but it is in a privy is the mulch or leaves that we're adding in. 
water and air are also essential parts of this as too much water will end up creating um, areas where that aren't getting the proper air circulation and you'll end up getting really gross rot that smells particularly dreadful. Um, if you end up getting too much air, you won't actually get enough breakdown and it'll end up being very dry. A lot of the issues that they have with their compost situations up at the huts in the whites because it's really difficult to compost in those high alpine arid environments, but they're still doing it. What we aim for is the ideal aerobic breakdown of all human waste in cat holes and privy. This is the type of breakdown that emits a minimal amount of carbon um, monoxide. We're talking about a 20th of the amount that um, it would be emitted in a landfill um, with regular food scraps or poop. And this is something that can be regularly achieved in the Appalachians um, with very little effort, to be honest with you. It can happen with just the properly dug cat hole. Rotting and composting are, are not the same thing exactly, just to kind of break down. Rotting and compo composting are different types of decomposition. When the proper composting balance is correct, the bacterial activity will be so great that it can reach temperatures as high as 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're looking at this picture, you're like, why am I looking at a guy with pitching a steaming pile of, I don't know what I'm looking at. That's food scraps that are in, in a proper balance. So that's over 2000 pounds of food scraps. that have been breaking down to somewhere between 1000 to 1500 pounds over a couple weeks in the proper balance. That is in the dead of winter and a food, um, something that is, uh, yeah, that one was pumping around 155 degrees that day. So that's why it was steaming. The reason why I know so much about this, why I'm so passionate about this, is that is me in that picture mixing that steaming pile of compost. It gets so hot that you cannot mix it in your chacos in the summertime. You will burn the tops of your feet. It's fantastic. Um, so what does this look like for us in the privies? Let's get back to the actual backcountry. So it's the same process that we're hoping to happen in um, privies themselves. Uh, there are a couple different options for privies, but either way, whether above ground or below ground, we're hoping that this proper balance between nitrogen and carbon can help break down um, in privies. And ideally, we, it can happen um, at a rate that it breaks down and continues to disperse in a healthy way, slower, so we never even have to move the outhouse or um, privy itself or do anything to kind of generally manage it. That's not the case in the, smoke, in, um, in the Smokies or the Appalachian Trail in general, as you see this privy on the right here, it's busted, needs some repairs. Um, I was actually out here on Tuesday um, to help look and kind of scope for that. But the idea behind that is that that one is actually on a slider itself in different containers. Once you fill up one side, you will either A, push the poop um, to the less populated side, or this one's set up so you actually slide the privy itself to the less populated side, so you don't have to handle the poop. There are generally two types of privies that we have on the Appalachian Trail. Steven, you just said that there were two types of privies and I'm seeing three pictures. I wanted to give you guys a little bit of um, a, a, a context for the other kind of not privy, but SST, sweet smelling toilet or a vault um, privy or toilet that you can see. So as you can see on uh, the left of this picture, a pit privy, there's a difference between a pit privy and a moldering privy. The general difference is, um, is, are, is my poop breathing? Is it breaking down? Um, is it, uh, or is it just a hole in the ground that they're hoping to move, to fill and move the outhouse after the fact? You can see that picture in the top left with the pit privy, the, all of the kind of contents, it either A is only for a small family of people, so you can kind of use it. It generally breaks down throughout the year and refill it so it doesn't completely fill. Or B, more likely than not, of the bubble in Georgia fills it up quickly, it volcanoes over and we have to move it over. Not as ideal. A moldering privy you can see in the bottom left um, is better because it's actually set up for that poop to continue to break down throughout the season. So A, um, the natural process is happening a lot faster. B, and B, you can actually get in the back of it and empty it out when you need to. Not if, but when, as that's what we have to do or what a lot of ATC employees, ridge runners and uh, um, maintainers and volunteers have to do. Yes, they have to scoop out your poop in the bottom of the privy and help put it to a designated place so it's not point source pollution. Um, the vault privies, which you see in a lot of front country campgrounds, um, have to be pumped out. So this is, um, the privy is kind of a misnomer because that's not, that poop's not going anywhere. Someone has to kind of go there and pump it out, which takes between $5,000 to $10,000 a year per vault privy. So I know what you're thinking, um, how do we keep this carbon balance in really deep backcountry areas? Let's hop on a quick tangent. So in the Smokies, actually, we have to fly in our carbon. Um, because it's in the national parks and because the smokes are so high up, we don't have enough broad leaves to have the option, um, proper carbon balance or leaf litter to be able to offset your poops. So what we have to do is we have to take very specific National Park Service bark that is from that is not doesn't have any weird insects on it that is taken from 
inside the park. We have to bag it up into 40 pound bags that are very specific because when you're weighing things for air operations, you need to be surgical specific. And then what we have to do is fly them into specific locations in the park and then disseminate them with different mule crews or people crews. This takes helicopter operations that we, um, it's uh, the same way we bring in different job boxes to keep our different tools in the backcountry and sometimes different shelters and privies themselves. Yes, this takes an awful, awful lot to deal with poop. This is just one small aspect. And again, there are, um, the ATC and the cooperative management system do a lot. This is just a, a, another fun way I get to spend a lot of my springs. One of the main things that, that carbon is doing and why we have to bring in all those different 40 pound bags of mulch in those uh, garbage bags that are kept in that net is to offset the moisture. What are the main sources of moisture that we're getting in those privies? Boom, pee. So that being said, I'm just gonna go ahead and say right now, ideally we are asking you not to pee in privies just to help limit that, pop, that moisture problem because it is really difficult to balance. It is difficult to get enough carbon there. Even if there, we don't have to fly in um, carbon, we have to keep mulch buckets or leaf litter buckets next to the privy full so people can put a scoop of that mulch or carbon in, in after they poop. It would be good for me to mention that too. So it takes a lot. So what we're asking you to do is try to pee outside of, um, outside of the privy. That is a lot easier for us fellas to do. So guys, you should um, try to be better for that in particular. And if you can just pee outside of the privy for everyone else. So I have this picture of a shelter on here because every dude and especially at the middle of the night and ladies too, go to pee in the exact same place in the middle of the night. And that is behind the shelter. What happens is everyone really just goes to the same place, pees, and that nitrogen smell builds up so quickly. You won't notice in particular because you will keep hiking throughout your day. You will end your break and keep going. But Ridge Runners and the smoke is in particular. When you go behind the shelters, it smells absolutely horrible. When the sun, sun hit it, hits it, it smells like there's a porta john out there. And it's not, we're not even talking about where the privy is. So, again, that nitrogen builds up on the soil, though it will be able to naturally break down um, we're asking you very much to kind of disperse that, pee somewhere where you think other people are not peeing. Again, it's a, a bit more difficult. Um, ladies have a bit better of an excuse for peeing in privies because it's harder to go farther. Guys have a much lower bar. They will, a lot of times, will just turn around and start peeing. Also, um, just a shout out for the ladies, there are other different ways you can kind of manage a different kind of a drip drying process. Um, some folks like to use um, bandanas that will hang out on the, um, Backs of their um, packs, they have these fancy uh, Kula claws that are uh, waterproof on one side, microbial on the other. Again, this is for just a dab to kind of limit moisture. Throughout your long distance hiking, you may decide to drip dry. You might want to use leaves. This is just another option to set yourself up for success. Figure out what you want to do ahead of time. All right, let's get down to business. Cat hole process. My absolute favorite, six to eight inches deep. Let's go in there. Which one of these cat holes does not belong in this picture? Did you find it? Did you find it? You found it, didn't you? All right, let's do this thing. All right, cat hole, um, step zero. Come correct. Uh, what, what, what you already need to do is to, um, set yourself up for success. Of course, you already know this because you're already listening to me yell high speed scat backs at you. I have a sincere kudos to you. Thank you for listening to me during your lunch break. Um, know thyself is the most important thing. So come correct, know exactly how you might wanna pee. And you see the strip with different uh, poo positions, you know, being like in the catcher's position makes my knees feel like they're about to squirt blood. So it doesn't work for me. I like a Captain Morgan where I kind of do a lunge thing on a higher object, maybe a rock to the right of me. The sapling stretch is also a good thing, but really knowing the different poop positions will help alleviate that anxiety. Also knowing and anticipating your needs. Um, you know, you probably might have to go to the bathroom after that first sip of coffee in the morning, like a lot of people. Really knowing exactly what direction you're heading for your cat hole, where your poop kit is, exactly what you're gonna wipe with um, is that much more important. What you're gonna wipe with, you say? Yes, so toilet paper is completely a good option in the Southeast. It might not be where you are, so make sure to check um, where that is. But generally speaking, below tree line on the Appalachian Trail, cat holing and putting toilet paper in those cat holing cat holes is acceptable. What isn't acceptable actually is putting wet wipes in those cat holes. Those will not break down as they do not break down in piping in particular. So we're asking you to actually pack that stuff out. That sounds super gross, but you can actually just have an opaque or a non-see-through bag to kind of stuff these more uh, less desirable things. Ladies have had to deal with that with, um, you know, having to dispose of tampons in the past. If you're thinking, I don't have any non-see-through um, trash bags, use a coffee bag. They already have a coffee scent so they can uh, kind of cover up any weird smells that you have that stuff. And it's, it's a metal bag that's easily resealable and a great trash bag option. 
Um, all right. And again, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer. Um, that is a picture of me at the end of my through hike holding up my orange trowel. Um, having the proper trowel really set you, um, having the proper tool will set yourself up for success. Yes, you can break that tool as you can break any tool under the improper amount of stress, but also any tool is capable of greatness under the proper amount of stress. So that 1.9 ounces of, or of $2 orange shovel when Georgia and Maine and I carry that shovel to this day. All right, step one now, the decision. So you're going to want to know exactly what direction you're going on. Over 200 feet away from the trail for the sake of other people and 200 feet from water for the sake of uh, the other different parasites and um, local ecology. So if you're, uh, if you're hiking uh, by yourself, I'm asking you to take your, all of your stuff with you. Don't just drop your bag and go off in a direction because of your smellables. Uh, yes, bears will break into your backpack and get your food even when you're pooping. They've got no shame. So take that stuff with you. If you've got your buddy who's willing to take a break, all that much better. If you're in camp, hang your stuff in your bear hang, or if you have someone to look after your food um, and stuff, all that much better, but something to pay attention to. Also, um, if, if I'm in camp, one of the first things I will kind of do is very much pick a direction where I can go over 200 feet away from the trail or water. You can be wrong and get this wrong a lot of times because of switchbacks, drainages can be weird, and it can be really disappointing. It's that much easier to figure this out when you're not about to poop your pants. Before I go to bed, I will take out my poo kit, um, non-scented uh, hand sanitizer, so not to hang or do anything, um, and I will put it in eyesight next to my hammock um, in the general direction I am hoping to go. So when I open my eyes, um, generally I my brain has already hit snooze on my colon's alarm clock a couple times, so I need to get up, grab my poo kit, shoot in that direction. Know exactly where you're going for the hunt. So when you're going and hunting in that direction, you already have a good direction. You're going at a good place. You're not shooting straight up a mountain that's going to end up putting you in danger um, because you've gone so far off trail and you're going for your good spot. My premium tip, the best tip, the reason why you showed up today, look for a rhododendron room. That's what this picture is of in here. Yes, it's in an ornamental fashion, but the idea is the same. Rhododendrons are basically gigantic bushes. They grow just like a bush an azalea does in your front yard, same family, except they will grow up to 50 to um, 75 feet tall and then will sprawl out up to 100 feet like this does. If you can get in there, it is almost empty in the middle of that thing. You can go in there, no one will be able to see you. The soil will be so soft, even in the middle of the mountains, and people will be able to walk by you and not be able to know you're in there. Go into the roto room. That is the best piece of advice that I have for you pooping in the woods in the Appalachians. Again, you still want to get over 200 feet off of trail, still want to get away from water, but you can really get out of sight and find some soft soil for easy digging. While you're on the hunt, again, give yourself as much time as possible. People rarely give themselves too much time. Um, if you find a good roto room, that digging will be very soft, or oh, I might be getting ahead of myself with the actual dig. The dig is the next step, but uh, really being just having that much more prepared um, for the amount of time it takes to actually dig a cat hole. Um, if you go just beyond the eye line for the shelter and you see one random bowling ball sized rock and you're like, I'm just going to flip that rock open, poop underneath that thing, put that thing back down. You, someone has already done that. The second you unflip that rock, you're about to see some heinous fecal mess somebody else has left as well as a mummy's amount of toilet paper. Um, there are a lot of bad decisions that have been made around pooping outside and you don't have to make them anymore because, you, because you're here today. Once you find a sweet spot, dig passionately. Um, and uh, take as much time as you can, but probably time is of the essence. Um, if you find a good spot, you can really be as comfortable as you want because no one will see you, no one will hear you, you can just do as you need, you're not looking over your shoulder. Um, that was the other thing that I had in that privy is that it didn't have any open front door. That's because at a good privy location, you don't actually need a door because there's plenty of places in the woods where you can set that thing up so no one should be out below you. We know where the trail is, we know where the traffic flow is, I digress because I'm already taking way too much time. Again, you want to get that cat hole six to eight inches deep. That is shallow enough so that poop can still do that composition and that breakdown, but deep enough that bears can't smell it and won't dig it and take it back out. Yeah, that's gross, but they can still get nutrients out of it. Digging can take 30 seconds. It can take 10 minutes. It is an amazing and awful philosophical moment when you don't have enough time and it is very humanizing. So set yourself up for success. Get as much time as you want. When you're digging this hole from six to eight inches, leave that soil just to the right of your um, uh, of your cat hole. What you're going to need to close that off, put your toilet paper in there, put your poop in there, and then take that soil and recover that hole. Um, if you are 
um, not comfortable stomping your boot back on that hole after the fact, then you have not dug a deep enough cat hole. If you're not comfortable stepping on it, then you shouldn't be setting somebody else up for it. I have stepped on poop in the backcountry twice. It sucks. Please dig a deep enough cat hole. Afterwards, boom, you are a cat hole champion. You've done it correctly. When you know you've done it right and it's six to eight inches, you have nothing but pride to feel. No one needs to tell you you've done it right because hopefully no one was watching you and can tell you that, tell you that. Only you know you did this right. And that is the essence of outdoor ethics in general is you can um, really set yourself up for success, do this amazingly um, in this compost process that will happily take your poop and break it down in the local Appalachian ecology and be a cat hole champion um, or not, uh, you know, create, surface dumps all over the Appalachian Trail and make the AT a little bit worse. No one will really know the difference. Um, the, uh, it's all up to you. And finally, uh, if you're not on the Appalachian Trail um, or you can't get into soil in particular, um, there are different ways where cat holing is not appropriate. Shout out to my guy, Ryan Soap to the left here. Any of my um, cat hole uh, illustrations were actually done by Ryan. Um, the poop position um, illustration done by Ryan. Me and him did a Knowles course um, together where we Used, had to use wag bags because we were on snow and a glacier the entire time. You cannot get to soil. You can't dig a cat hole. Um, do you know what you call digging a cat hole in snow is? Poop on ice. Yeah, that's not really a good joke. It's just a fact. Now you have in the bottom right here, people end up having to use groovers in a lot of sandy locations and the Grand Canyon in particular. That's pooping in this bag directly into this old ammo box. Um, again, you can't really dig a cat hole in sand. Uh, do you know what you call digging a cat hole? A uh, human digging a cat hole in sand is just a human litter box. Again, that poop's not going anywhere. In other weird places where you can't dig, you might have to use a poop tube. This is co um, common for kayakers. As you can see, this person made it to fit right between their legs when they're um, smearing the gnar gnar on some white water. Or I know people will dangle that on the edge of their rack on some big rock climbing wall stuff. Knowing how to deal with your poop is, uh, is an essential part of uh, outdoor recreation and uh, is unfortunately a really big problem systemically. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to learn how to properly poop outside. Yeah, it's a huge problem all over public lands in general. Uh, it's something that's just so uncomfortable to talk about that people are just gonna generally think that it'll break down but forget that people are gonna have to walk by your toilet paper and poop constantly as it breaks down. Um, so the AT needs you to help spread the message about poop and everything. Tell your friends before they have to poop how to properly poop is really what it comes down to. We got a good question, Stephen. Any tips for rainy days? Yeah, um, um, rainy days are kind of a suck it up thing, unfortunately. I, I, that's not really a good tip. Um, my best bet is really flexing because I'd use a hammock system. So that means that I have a hammock and a tarp above me. So sometimes if I'm not camped around other people or two on trail, I can dig a cat hole underneath my tarp. Otherwise, um, if you can get over to, if you're camping farther away from folks, if people can't see you, other times I have run Pooh Bear style with just a rain jacket on in the middle of the night, deep in a downpour to dig my cat hole because I wasn't going to get my clothes wet. No one else could see me. There are not good answers when it comes to a downpour. It's just uh, enjoy that you are having a real wild experience. Yeah, I think the toilet paper is kind of the hardest part of that. Uh, you know, if you're already totally soaking wet, digging, digging the cat hole and, and doing the business isn't the hard part, but trying, maybe just trying to think through uh, any way that you could make the handling the toilet paper, taking out of that Ziploc and <laughs> all of that kind of as quick and efficient as possible. That's when I, it is, I'm not really a poncho wearer. I'm a raincoat and a trash bag inside the um, lining my backpack. That's my kind of rain system, but poncho would come in handy for the cat hole situation. <laughs> and I have a question about the Smokies. Um, I've, I've heard, I know that you have to stay near the shelters when you go through the Smokies and I've heard uh, most of them don't have privies and there tends to be a poop hill. And I mean, do you have any advice? It sounds like there are areas that are overused there. Um, so there's one, um, I forget exactly what it is, one of the first shelters people come across when they're going northbound in the Smokies, that's the one that really doesn't have a privy and mm -hmm. has, um, there's two or three instances where the, yeah, there's a couple waste zones that have, that are literally known internationally because there's just white downy flowers as far as the eye can see and it's super gross. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to even go without stepping on poop. Um, 
there are privies in other situations, but yeah, that's what ends up happening if we don't know how to, if we, people won't kind of take the time to properly cat hole, be committed to that, you'll just get up, get up, end up with a lot of spaces where it's the opposite of what anyone wanted their smoke use experience to be. <laughs> one, one thing you can do, and it's not, um, not something you're going to be do, able to do all the time, but in general, uh, if you can go when you're not at camp, like on, in the middle of the day, that's mm -hmm. great. Now, you can't usually like tell our bodies when it's time to poop, and most folks do either want to go right when they wake up in the morning or kind of at the end of the day after dinner. But in those cases where you can, if you know like you're, you're in a routine where you kind of know exactly when you're going to poop, you might be able to do it um, when you're still a mile out from getting to camp or something like that. Mm -hmm. Especially in the smoky. <laughs> Just go on that, that full 200 feet. I, I think around those uh, those toilet areas um, and at those shelters, if you were to count the steps to where you start seeing those toilet paper wads and signs of poorly done cat holes, you are not, you probably have not gone 200 feet yet. I mean, people do not count their 70 steps in general. Um, so if you think of it as like a radius around the shelter. The closer you get to that 200 feet, you keep going, you're more likely to find an area that's not been used already. Mm -hmm. But it's harder on, on steep terrain because you might be going way down the hill. <laughs> I have one tip that I don't know if uh, you mentioned, Stephen. I might have missed it if you did. When you're in a situation where you got to go right now, you know, um, you and if you have to choose between. Uh, you're like, I, I can't go 200 feet and dig a cat hole. I'm, I'm going to poop my pants kind of thing. Go 200 feet. Just go on the ground. You can always dig a hole later. And, um, you know, chop sticks with some sticks you find or whatever it takes to kind of move uh, your deposit into the hole. It'd be better to go that distance than to try and dig a, a shallow hole um, if you're really, you know, needing to go. Just do your best. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that, Catherine. That's a vital part of this, though. I always forget because, yeah, it's it's difficult to time. Let's face it. I don't know. We're eating weird food in the back country. Our bodies are weird. So, you know, that might end up happening one in five times, even if you're doing your best. So, yeah, just even if you can't dig it ahead of time, use, use a stick to push it in. But yeah, that was the other thing I, I really pushed back over, but just to really hit home. Um, when you're digging your cat hole, you're digging that, you're putting your um, trowel into soil. And you're using a stick, let's say, to kind of push that soil back in. Maybe if you need to touch anything gross, you're doing it with a stick. Um, mm -hmm. And no point in time does your trowel have to touch anything gross is really what I'm trying to get across. It's just dirt, soil. It doesn't have to touch any poop. Um, another point to get home, if, if you're, if you're going to hand your trowel to somebody else, just also throw that out there. I mean, to the best of my recollection, um, I, I can't think of any private places outside of um, the overly obvious, let's say, walking through your hot springs, um, mm -hmm. where you can't just really go for it over 200 feet. Um, yeah, again, outside of the urban places where it's obvious, socially unacceptable, mm -hmm. um, there isn't that many gigantic patches of private land on the AT because we've spent a lot of time trying to buy it, buy pieces of land and relocate it to those areas. So okay. um, it, if it does kind of kind of touch a corridor or if the corridor gets really tight more often than not, so 200 feet would literally be into a little bit of private property. Chances are that private property backs up to the Appalachian Trail and probably just a national forest in general. So um, it's generally more realistic. In my footprint, that's not a problem. We don't have any property in the southeast. Property in the southeast. I don't know, Catherine Fieldford. I'd love to hear your point of view. Yeah, we've got a few a few uh, areas up here in Virginia where the trail is on a pretty narrow corridor. But in general, like Stephen was saying, it's um, it's an easement through private property, but often that's farmland or it's, it's forested land. So you may mm -hmm. be on somebody else's property, but it's not like you're in someone's backyard. So if you dig that whole cat hole properly they're never going to know um, that it was there and it's not going to impact, you know, wildlife or water quality or anything like that if you've done the six to eight inches down. So. Well, seriously, thank you all so much. When it comes to poop or waste in general, it's either, it's, it's delightful that in the Southeast, again, we can actually have a proper process where we don't have to carry it out. Um, in a lot of arid places in the Southwest, 
there's a lot of more awkward situations where we have to either have to figure out a way to deal with that poop or carry it with you. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, hoping, Stephen, that the next time we do this, we'll have to get someone from New England because I'd be curious. I, uh, I'd never heard of the Roto Room. That's something you can only look for in the South. So I wonder what the uh, New England equivalent of a Roto Room would be. Um, all right, that's just about it. Um, quick other shout outs. Uh, if snow is available, it's a great toilet paper option. It contours and dissolves after the fact. Um, so even though you might not be able to cat hole when you're using snow, or if it might not be like 10 feet of snow, um, so it's a great option. Um, if you're going with leaves, your striped maple, your um, water lilies are good options. Um, rhododendron really, it actually has vertical breaks, so even though it looks really big. But again, these are fine options that you should know about because you might run out of toilet paper. Um, knowing exactly how much toilet paper can be uh, just as much of a balance that you're doing. So you have the information. Go forth and uh, do great things, Kangol Champions.